Hello, my name is Rob Young. I'm speaking today on behalf of the European Federation for Medicinal Chemistry, and in particular, the Best Practices Working Party, who you can see listed on the slide on the screen. It's been my great pleasure to lead this initiative on describing the best practices for hit to leads generation in medicinal chemistry. This is a working party that's been very ably led by, by John Kankar, and I should also acknowledge the input of Brian Cox, who helped me get this slide deck over the line. Okay, yeah, here we go. So what we're gonna look at today, we need to understand what the hit to lead process is, and then we need to really understand what we can do to understand and quantify the process. And we will look at FISCHEM properties, efficiency metrics, and, and other best practices to, to get the best out of, out of your hit to lead work. And we'll also look a little bit at tactics. Some of these are rather more in the supplementary slides than in the main part, and you will see some good examples of this in, in, in the other presentations that, that, that do come. But we just need to understand what we need to do to best quantify uh, everything in, in this process. But underneath all of this, I think a really important thing is that quality is a, is a destination, not a journey. So there may be some things that you need to address in your molecule as you go forward, and more often than not in a lead uh, even a lead optimization, there are some things that you're aware of that you need to put right with, with, with your molecule. So you're not necessarily the perfect drug, but it just gives you reason to believe that you can get where you need to. And of course, most importantly, you need to be able to, to, to patent your compound. And these are all themes that, that we will pick up on as we go through the talk. Um, so as I said, you know, do look for some of the other material that will be in the slide deck. So this is a slide we thought we would start on. It, this is one of the best papers that I've read in the last few years by Andreas Bender at University of Cambridge, looking at a lot of the, the hype and, and talk at the moment about AI in drug discovery and what it really brings and what is most important in the drug discovery process. And the important take homes of this is it's not about speed. It doesn't matter how quickly you do things. So people who still continually talk about speed are deluding themselves, I'm afraid to say. But there's a really nice examples that if you if you have really good quality in your compounds, ultimately the savings you have in that program because of the lesser failure rate will far more uh, compensate for any cost you save and any time you save in that process. So I, you know, I would I would implore you to to to, to read through this paper and, and really understand that. And I guess the understanding of what we will bring forward today is you know what can you do to address and, and assess the quality of the compounds that you're work, working with and can you see a way forward beyond where you are at any stage in the program so what can you do to prioritize you know which molecules should you make over any others and ultimately it's a, it's a decision about making investments in terms of time money and you know and more people making more compound you know, which ultimately will, will tell you how much more it's going to cost monetarily and this will impact in terms of the quality on how far you may take this if you do the right decision especially if you're in an industrial setting <clears throat> is this a good time to stop a program if you can see that you're not making progress because it's very important not to be wasting money on something that, that doesn't really have a good chance and, and assessing that is, is, is actually quite a difficult thing so we will we will discuss that as we go through so <clears throat> you saw a variation on this in one of in one of john's slide earlier where, where you could see that there has previously been a webinar about hit generation and hit validation so we can take that as red and then we come into this little bit here about what can we do <clears throat> on just small numbers of compounds to give us further confidence to invest more time effort and money into our series of compounds if you like you often talk about a lead series not just a lead compound so can we expand the structure activity relationship so you can show that the, the activity is held in more than one compound can you get some kind of pharmacokinetic exposure can you get some maybe some efficacy is your compound selective is it non-toxic etc etc these were things that we will look at in in this this early stage there's nothing really to <clears throat> say that you could go from a hit to a candidate fairly quickly. If we work well, if we use our predictions well and use our experience and understanding, you may go from your hit to a candidate, even a drug in a very few compounds. That's the way it used to happen when I first joined the industry. Um, we've kind of got a little bit 
unfocused on 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 what we do in 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 our medchem programs. And I do think that you know there's no reason we have to go through a process if we can use our brain power a, a little more, a little better in in, in in cleverer ways. So what we're doing, we're, we're, you know, we've got validated hits, and how can we demonstrate <clears throat> that it's worthwhile putting? more into this series and then beyond that can we see that our compound has got a good chance of becoming a medicine and this is almost a, a variation on, on the previous slide but I think what, what this brings forward is just what the the industry and the industry is, is, is obsessed with with the numbers and, and and the metrics and I'm one I'm one of the first people to almost to rail against some of these numbers you know, so do we really need to make a billion or you know tens of thousands of compounds in discovery to screen it to get a hit? Can we be, be smarter than that? And can we choose between those as to which ones we optimize to get forward to a fewer number of preclinical compounds? And all of this can take a long time to get to where we need to do. And then ultimately, we just get a few compounds, a few candidates that go through the clinical trial phases, which you can read about in, in, in other talks. That gets us ultimately to phase three and one approved drug. So in a way, we funnel down from these very many compounds just to get one compound. But what you need to realize, as well as the, the time scales along here, is just understand how much you need to do. And it's a thing that very often in, in, in academia or even away from the drug development settings, that people don't quite realize that the routes you're using to make your compounds often have to be taken almost all the way through to commercialization to be able to produce that drug. So with the chemistry you've got, can you go from a few micrograms or a few milligrams that you often start with in the early stages to use similar chemistry? You may get a slightly different route, but you've got to actually be able to make hundreds of kilograms or literally tons of compound to deliver a drug. And this has to be thought of in, in this whole process. But as well, can we do this with making fewer compounds and can we make higher quality compounds? And as we saw on that first slide, if we have higher quality, we should have higher chances of success. We won't talk a lot in this, this, this presentation about attrition, but it is a bit of an, an issue in, in all drug discovery. And if you do have higher quality compounds, as you saw from the paper, you will actually speed up the clinical trials because they become a lot more predictable. So what can we do to influence this journey? So we've said we've got a set of validated hits. And what we're going to do now is we're going to look at some of these criteria when we are prioritizing our series within hit to leads. In terms of initial SAR, we're going to look at ligand deficiency and LLE, lipophilic ligand deficiency. And we will describe those in some detail. Very good metrics and benchmarks to understand where you are. Where are we in terms of the, the drug metabolism and pharmacokinetics of our compounds? So is a compound soluble, permeable, and metabolically reasonably stable? Are we selective over related targets to a particular compound? Are we just hitting one kinase or one protease rather than like a pan inhibitor of all the targets? Or can we get indications that we can achieve this? Again, are we synthetically tractable? Are we stable? Um, I'm afraid there's an extra, <clears throat> there's a, 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 a misspelling here. Um, and there's no toxic, of course. We haven't got any motifs in our compound that could cause us issues further on, on down the line. And we must be, if you're going to make a drug in a favorable IP situation, we must be able to protect the invention to make all the investment worthwhile. So we will use these to make our candidate. But we also need to remember that sometimes we may be just looking for a tool compound that might just be used to validate an assay or validate a model. And you should bear in mind that many of the things we talk about in a drug also need to be there for a tool, because if the compound isn't as selective as you think it is, you may not be properly testing that mechanism. And of course, different targets have different bars. Sometimes you can accommodate a less selective compound for particularly difficult targets and you know cancer therapy early antivirals probably come in, into those categories but a drug that you're going to take in large quantities over the long term will obviously need to be very very safe so this is expanding a little bit 
on previous slides. So, you know, what are the drivers of potency in our series? And, you know, we talked about looking at liabilities, and as I said, we're focusing on oral drugs to make sure that we can get the proper exposure after taking a, a pill. And we need to sort of show that we can actually change some of these liabilities, we can improve them, perhaps make some worse, whilst we can still maintain potency, because if you can change the structure and maintain potency, you're not in a great place. So as we look at the structure activity relationships and potencies, can we put different groups in different positions of the molecule? Are we flexible enough to understand some of this SAR? Do we understand the bioactive conformation? Can we constrain our molecule? Can we use that to influence our design? In doing this, can we swap scaffolds? Can we change rings around to improve our structure, maybe improve its properties or improve its activity or selectivity as we subtly change the compound as well as any substituents that, that we might want to put on it? We've talked a lot about admin, admin and physchem already, so so that's absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. People often use this interchangeably with, with pharmacokinetics. They're slightly different ways of saying the same thing. But to achieve, all, to achieve all of these, if you've got an oral drug, the compound will need to be soluble, it will need to be permeable, and it will need to have a certain amount of stability. I think electron on, on pharmacokinetics is another thing that we should bring in at some stage. Also, we need to look within our compounds at safety. Do we have a good HERG profile? So the human etherogogo related gene really is what HERG stands for. It's a, cardi it's a cardiac ion channel that can often cause toxicity, especially with basic lipophilic compounds. Our cytochrome P450s, do we have risks of being either heavily metabolized or maybe we're inhibiting the metabolism of other drugs. So this is where you get drug-drug interactions. Very important to keep an eye on this. Early off-target safety panels. You know, there are things like Pan Labs and, and other producers that will allow you to screen 40 or 50 targets just to get an understanding of how specific your compound might be. We might start looking at genetic toxicity, an AIMS test or something similar, just to see any potential risks of our compound. We mentioned the efficiency metrics already, and we can use these as a guide because these are things you would like to think you could improve in your hit to lead process and various analyses show that this does happen, as you'll see. And you could also just again, to reiterate, looking at the tractability of your compound, can you readily make it from reasonably priced starting materials? And is it patentable? A very, very important issue. So the best practice is to quickly re reach this no-go decision such that you know, any liability, you've got an indication that you might be able to address it in your programme. Of course, I'm conscious that there are many people here in, in academia, as we, as we saw from the poll at the beginning. Um, you know, there's some great training to be had, just understanding the SAR, the synthesis, and just the basics of drug discovery. So you, know, you may have a little bit more leeway here. Um, but you do have to manage those expectations of just how valuable your compound might be if you think that this compound could make it all the way to become a drug. It's a, an interesting thing maybe for the panel to discuss later. So realistically, this is a slide that I, I use very often in, in my training courses, is that we have our hit compound, so we're looking towards getting a lead, so we've got to move somewhere on this journey from a hit to a drug. And we need to be able to address all of these things about our compound. Is it soluble? Is it absorbed? Is it safe? And is it metabolically stable? And very often these things are governed by, 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 by different patterns and, and different properties. So, you know, where do we best start on this journey? You know, we may have a soluble compound that's potent, it may be stable, but as we change things, these things can change very quickly. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make an efficacious compound, not just a potent compound. And I've been explaining this to several judges recently in expert witness trials for, for, for a major drug. It's just this, this difference, you know, we mustn't just be focused on that nanomolar, picomolar level of activity that our compound must have. You may be 100 picomolar as a compound, but unless you've got good pharmacokinetics, that compound could be completely worthless. You need that balance of activity and good properties and also good safety 
in it as well. So your potency is, is your activity versus this isolated target or tissue, and your efficacy is the effective translation of this potency to a demonstrable in vivo effect. You know, what are the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of your compound? And that's ultimately what we're trying to do in discovery. And we're setting ourselves on our way to this as we do our hit to lead program, building confidence in our molecule. And of course, all of the things that we talk about in this diagram, they're all related to the physical chemical properties of the model. And these are things that you must look at to secure your efficacious and safe molecule with a low dose. Low dose is the best thing you can always aim for with a drug. So to go into physical chemical properties, as you heard earlier, this is a thing that's a, a major hobby of mine. And like a politician, I would say to people, there are three things that matter in drug discovery. They are lipophilicity, lipophilicity, and lipophilicity. It could be just a way of emphasizing a point, but actually these days you need to look potentially at three kinds of lipophilicity. So we all know about log P, the partition coefficient, which is the neutral form, or if your compound doesn't have an ionizable center, it's the only partitioning that you'll get of that compound between layers. It's defined as being the partition between a solvent and aqueous levels uh, layers. Um, in drug discovery, of course, octanol for many years has been the gold standard. But if you look in the supplementary, you can see how those things are subtly changing. So you need to make your compound a little bit more hydrophilic to avoid many other problems, as you'll see in due course. So log P is quite simple to understand. And even if your compound has a charge center, it still has an, in, an inherent uh, lipophilic uh, log P, so a partitioning. So if your compound, if you're, if you're cheating on your log D by, by putting a charge in to, to lower the effective lipophilicity, it's the inherent lipophilicity you know, without the charge of the uncharged form of your compound that actually causes the issue when it comes to toxicity and things. So you need to keep an eye on both of these. You can't just bring charge in to address any shortcomings in the partitioning. So the partitioning is of all the species of your compound, and this will depend on the pKa of the compound you're looking at, and also the, uh, the pH of the relevant medium that we're looking at at any given time. Obviously in the stomach, we're looking at pH two. In the duodenum, where compounds are absorbed, it's about 6.5. Most of the physiology takes place at pH 7.4, the so-called physiological pH. So depending on our environment, things will change and the compound will be behaving differently. But as we get to bigger and bigger molecules, especially ones that are flexible, and this is an example taken from um, the, the bottom paper, there's this so-called dynamic lipophilicity. The bigger compounds, and especially things like cyclopeptides and, and, and many natural products, can have a hydrophobic or a hydrophilic face depending on the environment they're in. So you can get this dynamic equilibrium between the, 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 the different faces of the compound. And this is where you bring this thing called EPSA that was developed at Pfizer for better understanding these properties. So these are the fundamental things that you need to understand. And do remember to measure lipophilicity as well as just calculating it, because C log P is what it says, it's just the calculation. You need to have a good understanding of what the compound really is, because many compounds are not calculated so well but the predictors are getting better and better. But I would also, the other suggest, there's two more things to keep an eye on as being your flatness. Ideally, your aromatic ring count, it keeps it simple and it's much more relevant. Or well, people have spoken a lot about the escape from flatland and the 3D shape of compounds in terms of FSP3. Um, that number doesn't actually correlate with very much, unlike aromatic ring count, but it's just that principle of escaping from flatland and not having too many aromatic rings in your compound. And when you do this, you need to do this in, in, in the context of minimalizing the number of rotatable bonds. You need to confirmationally restrain your molecule to help in the entropy of, of any binding events. So those to me are the, the simple things to keep an eye on. And this is a slide that you can tell came from Switzerland, um, from, from John at Novartis, just looking at the different ways of going up the ridge to get to the optimal lipophilicity of your compound. And you'll see in this and other, other slides, just the effect of 
decreasing lipophilicity. You will often lose potency, but you will increase solubility, you will decrease metabolism, which are good. You may reduce permeability. You'll reduce promiscuity and toxicity. Um, and obviously, if you increase it, if you're too lipophilic, you have the opposite effects. And it's just trying to guide that way up this easier ridge than the steep slopes of the mountain are the best things you can do. Um, people talk about a sweet spot. Um, it kind of works, but it, it's not a rule. Um, I believe that nature especially will help us expand medicinal chemistry space an awful lot, but that is a, a talk for another day. We do know that optimal permeation occurs at a log D of three. Look at the ABV MPS, which is referred to later on, and just find the right range for your scaffold. No, no two things are alike, and you can't be too prescriptive on this. So just reduce it as much as possible whilst you retain everything else in your compound, which is the essence of LLE that we will come on to. And lipophilicity also impacts many other things, plasma protein binding, distribution, retention in tissue, biliary and renal clearance. There's an awful lot of things that will happen when you change your lipophilicity number. So one thing that is particularly important and that, that I've worked with many times over, over the years is, is the solubility of a compound. And when you're working in drug discovery, you should always keep an eye <coughs> on the behavior of your compounds. In industry these days, people tend not to handle compounds. Many things are outsourced. They come in in a few milligrams, they're made up in DMSO, and they're handled only by robots, not by human beings, let alone chemists, as a, an old joke would say. Um, but when you do handle compounds, you get an understanding of the way your compound behaves. And, and I, I use Kiki Bergstrom's paper quite a lot. Just the idea that you've got high melting compounds that are brick dust, and brick dust doesn't dissolve in anything. If you can't dissolve your NMR sample in DMSO, in water, or whatever else, you've got very little chance of, you know, of, of, of going forward. So that's telling you something about your compound. But you can also get very lipophilic compounds, which we will call grease balls. And you know, they won't dissolve in water, they may go into chloroform or organic solvents, but those are things, as you'll see from lipophilicity, are not necessarily a particularly good place. They're two things that contribute to poor, poorly soluble compounds. And my good friend Alan Hill to always used to talk, to talk to me about the Alkoski equation. And this is like a, a, <clears throat> and, and a sort of a, a put, put, put in these feelings in, 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 into numbers. And it shows you that with certain log P values, with a range of melting points, you can get different levels of solubility. So these numbers in here are the log of the solubility, which is derived from uh, a constant plus a minus a multiple of the melting point minus the log P of the compound. And this has been shown to, to work very, very well. And we've also got highlighted on this what those numbers would mean in terms of micromolar solubility. So in GSK, we would always used to say that if you're less than 200 micromolar, you could have potential issues with your solubility. 30 to 200 is sort of somewhere on the cusp. And less than 30 micromolar is a poorly soluble compound. And you've got to think about what levels of solubility you need to have to deliver your compound. Solubility is very complex, and we do kind of skirt over a little bit of it in the following slides. There are, there are more details in, in, in the supplementaries. But just using this as a guideline, I think, is very important. So you can see that the average, the drug, the average drug having a log P of 3 is very much commensurate with the level if you've got a lower melting point where you've got a reasonable chance of getting good solubility. And as you go up to higher lipophilicity, and I think nobody regards Lipinski anymore, I, I hope, um, <laughs> I can give you references to, to this as well. Um, you, know, you, you, know, you, you need to understand the, the premise of, of the way that the rules came about, but it's basically shown to you that when you get up to five, you've got very little chance of achieving solubility. So you know, this isn't perfect maths, but it's a very good principle to follow. And, and, and the, uh, the Arkoski equation works quite well, and you can use log D instead of log P, as, as we showed. So just use that in your thinking. And this is just a little bit more detail. So you can think about the lipophilicity and the solid state of your compound in this sort of, sort of three-cornered hat model, um, and also the ionization of your compound. If you do bring some ionization in, that can actually sometimes help you. And you just need to understand you know, how your compound is behaving in terms of aqueous solubility. So in the early stages, you know, getting solubility from DMSO stock, which is in big companies and even many CROs and, 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 and providers will allow you to do this quite quickly and at quite low cost on, on very little compound. Um, so, you know, 
things will never get better from that DMSO high throughput solubility measurement. You know, you, you haven't got much about the crystallinity of your compound when it's taken from DMSO, and it could slightly overestimate, but nonetheless, it's a good benchmark. Then as you go through, you know, further towards lead optimization, you may want to start looking at other, other, other methods of understanding your solubility. Do you have a single crystalline form rather than an amorphous form that would tend to be more soluble? We've all done those crystallizations, and back when I was still at university, we used to have to recrystallize compounds for melting points. And the first compounds, when I first joined the industry, you used to have to almost recrystallize the constant melting point before you could have it signed off for, for, for evaluation. But things have changed now. We, now people just make a few migs. So it's just understanding of that solubility. And there's sort of three examples here. They're all taken from, from this chapter in the uh, Royal Society of Chemistry guidebook, where things, there are things that you can do to help with your, your, your solubility. And this example here, <clears throat> there's a, a, a changing of the scaffolds and the structures. We've taken an aromatic ring out and the lipophilicity has been reduced. And as a, as a result of that, we'll talk about PFI in a second, we've improved the solubility of the compound. This compound here, this ring has been saturated and there was a huge difference in the melting point of those even though the, the lipophilicity was only changed slightly. But there's a big, big change in the solubility of those two compounds. You may also consider rescuing with a basic centrin. We've talked about, obviously, when you protonate a, a, a lower pH, you will tend to be more soluble in, in, in water. So it's a tactic that can sometimes be used, but it's a thing that you do need to use with care, as further slides and, and, and uh, this chapter would suggest. So PKA. Um, there are acids and bases in drugs. I guess this graph would suggest that there are more bases than there are acids. Lots of people often bemoan that, that there aren't that many examples of acids. But I think quick mass would tell you there that there are only um, maybe sort of six or seven hundred charged compounds in the drugs. There are several thousand drugs on the market. So what that's suggesting to you is that you know, more compounds than not are neutral. But nonetheless, you can see that there are no particularly strong acids. You know, we're wrong around about the PKA of, of acetic acid here for the, the most common one. And, you know, it, it's somewhere in the nines where you will find most of the basic compounds. So they're not particularly strong bases and you can get much stronger bases than that in natural molecules such as amidines and guanidines in, in amino, excuse me, in amino acids. But by and large, we tend to have to keep that basicity in check. So these are things that PK can affect, and there's some good sources there to read more about it and its, its impact on drug discovery. So I mentioned just now a useful solubility guide, and this is a, a real kind of rush into it that we noticed nearly 15 years ago when we first did this. So this is a graph of solubility. Low solubility is red, high solubility is green, and it's a distribution based on all of these pies with a combination of lipophilicity bins. This is done on the GSK chromatographic scale. And up here we have the number of aromatic rings. And there is a, a slope on here, which is a line of one compared with the number of rings and the, and the lipophilicity that shows you that an aromatic ring is, is equivalent to another, lip, another unit or another log of lipophilicity on your compound. And it led us to the so-called solubility forecast index or the property forecast index. So if you keep this number low, you've got better chance of achieving reasonable solubility. And uh, I really enjoyed reading this blog by Pat Walters last year, where, where, it, where it shows that um, he still has yet to see any AI method that outperforms the SFI as a predictor of solubility. So it's that principle of keeping rings down and keeping lipophilicity down will help you progress your programs. And this is just a, a further incarnation of it, where we looked at other developability ratios, and it shows you that keeping these numbers down, it will give you a better outcome in terms of cytochrome fuel 50s, protein binding, intrinsic clearance, and HERG and promiscuity as well. Um, of course, you do have to make some allowances to get optimal permeability, but that's a story for another day. So just a quick tour of, of this. We need to move on now into, into um, ligand deficiency and we need, we need to maximize um, 
where, where we are with ligand deficiency. So every atom in your in your molecule needs to be as eff effective as, as possible. So it came from fragments where people looked at when you had very low levels of activity, how could you prioritize working on one over another? And it's a good thing that, you know, don't waste things in your molecule because if you put too many atoms in, they could cause you problems. And many analyses have shown that maximizing efficiency is a good tactic. <coughs> I'm starting to realize that the time is ticking on a little. Um, so another theory on, on a similar vein is looking at lipophilic ligand efficiency. So how potent is your compound in comparison of its lipophilicity? We said that making compounds lipophilic tends to make them more active. But most drugs will reside up here where we have balance between lipophilicity and potency. So it's the difference between these two values. And this is the embodiment of a proclamation from Corwin Hanch that said that you should make your compound as hydrophilic as possible without losing your efficacy. And this is a summary from, from a paper I wrote with Paul Leeson, looking at practices in, in, in different Hitterly processes. And there are a few other references along here where further analysis have been done along, along these lines. So what it says to you is that when people are looking at, at, at potency and they're looking at lipophilicity, so we're comparing and contrasting the practices in published papers where people were taking an account of the lipophilicity of their molecules. And you can see that there, that there are vast improvements when people are looking at it, and we would suggest better outcomes. But what's really, really interesting, the, the ligand deficiency, so how many atoms the best compounds have, doesn't actually change very much during an optimization process. So this is kind of governed by the, the particular target that you work on. So you may want to prioritize a compound as a higher ligand deficiency over that of a, of a lesser one, because that's something that doesn't change very much in optimization. So usually potency will go up and lipophilicity may come down, but those are things that you will look at as you go through your hit, through your hit to lead, through your candidate process. So you can see contrast in the properties. So this is a nice example um, from AstraZeneca, where they've used LLE to prioritize which compounds to work on. And they focus on improving potency whilst improving properties. And you can see the tactics that were used to change a T-butyl group into ultimately this isopropyl heterocycle that reduced the Lipophilicity or maintain the lipophilicity of, 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 of the compound overall, but it changed the, the, the nature of the compound through these intermediate ones. And it also reduced the, uh, the, the lipophilicity ultimately to get the best compound and have minimal interaction risks and, 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 and less reactivity in the compound. <coughs> and it was also looking at things like the free drugs. So there were many things that, that, that were coming into this optimization. So this idea of, of leading edge potency is a good place to be. And you can see where the best, you know, obviously you need to have a certain level of potency, but you can see how along the way they're moving in the right direction. Um, this is a trajectory analysis comparing three drugs, three <clears throat> of the HRV integrase inhibitors. And on, on this one, red is actually the better one, which sort of shows that dolotegavir was amongst the very best compounds by this kind of analysis ever made for the target. So you're, you're, you know, you're, you're getting it compound as, as potent as possible while, whilst reducing the lipophilicity as much as you can as well. So this is more advanced lead off, but it's sort of showing you the trajectory as the program progresses. So this is the thinking behind this. Where do you start in your program? You know, where, what, where was your hit? Were you a fragment? Were you a lead-like compound? Were you an HTS hit that's quite typically not particularly potent, not great properties? Or you may have been very potent and very lipophilic. And you know, these are the ways that you would need to move as your program progresses. And are you demonstrating progress in the right direction? You know, there's many ways of, of navigating on this diagram. And this is an example from the P38 kinase program. Again, this is from, from the paper I wrote with Paul Leeson uh, five years ago now, um, where we contrasted the different practices of different companies against the same target. And you can see that many just increased the PFI. So they were adding aromatic rings, lipophilicity, as they optimized their compound. So the crosses are the start points in the programs. And then we get the ultimate places where the, <clears throat> the programs ended up. And you can see there are marked differences. You know, some people actually reduce lipophilicity a lot. They actually 
you know, there, were, there were different tactics employed, but the principles are in there of moving ultimately in the right direction. Of course, this is only calculated. If you take measurements, the picture may be a little bit different. And this isn't the only metric to look at. You know, some of these are more efficient than others. You almost need a dashboard where this is just one of your dials to help you understand what is truly better. And a couple of these compounds are still alive in, in the clinic today. But you can just see and you can compare and contrast different companies' outcomes and the different tactics employed. So, you know, a lot of people will, will talk about this, that if you just optimise on, on activity, you may just get good ligands. But if you do property optimization at the same time, you've got a much better chance of producing better drugs. And just in a nutshell, this one looks at it, where you look at the median ligand efficiency across very, very many targets. And you also plot that against the LLE. And it's been shown that most drugs will appear at the leading edge of any analysis like this. They're the most ligand efficient and the most ligand lipophilicity efficient. So you would tend to be top right in a plot like this. But what this is looking at are Paul's data on the averages for different targets. So what this shows you is you cannot be prescriptive on any given target. So you must have an LE of 0.3 or you must have an LLE of five because for some targets, those figures would be, you know, very difficult to achieve. So these are all, the, all of the examples highlighted here are, are examples in our review. And most of these have drugs on that target. And, you know, so for some of them, 0.3 would be very conservative and you can actually achieve, you can make much better compounds than that on average. But for others, you need to make allowances. So this is where benchmarking can, can come in again against um, competitors or just getting further data on understanding how good your compound is. So in addition to some of the metrics, this is just a, a few slides now with a, a few flavors about tractability. So what can you do in terms of the chemistry you've got? So this is a nice example that came from, from, from Aztecs where they start talking about sociable fragments. You know, what have you got in the, in the chemistry and, 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 the, and, the, and the, the particular functional groups in your program? that looks like a way of, of readily optimizing your, your fragment. You know, are there places that you can use your imagination and chemistry to take you and grow your compound in other directions? So you would look at the binding and you would look at, at potential growth vectors. So just consider how well you could develop synthesis from the compound. And here as well, it's just talking about the chemistry toolbox. You know, how much can you invest in terms of the compounds you put into collections or the compounds that you screen? looking ahead one or two steps to thinking, you know, what can you do to vary that structure? So it's, if you like, a little bit like um, sociability and tractability, but if there's higher quality in the things that you screen, then ultimately you've got more opportunities to make more variations going forward in your discovery programs. Um, you may also need to understand about what you can do in terms of, of novelty. So these are some examples that, 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 that came from Novartis. And two of these were, 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 were worked on. And this particular series had to be stopped because there was a patent published by a competitor. So this came from a, a non-exclusive commercial library. So if you're working from some of these sources, just be mindful. You may have to diversify your structure. You may need to scaffold hop. Otherwise, you could run the risk of, of, of running into patent issues. Um, and similarly here, there, there was a, a little bit of a lack of novelty. Some of the properties weren't so good. So most of the effort was focused on this compound that came from a legacy, a, yeah, a legacy project that gave far more opportunities for um, you know, synthetic tractability and, and synthetic variation. So be mindful of this in, in any program you work on. So just finally, just a little bit about DMPK. Um, can you get an idea of how much exposure you may get from your compound? You always want to minimize your clearance and minimize the metabolism of your compound that may come from microsomes, from hepatocytes. Abvi will always say you need to be soluble, permeable, and low clearance to achieve a good or prediction. Um, but not all drugs are, you know, are hugely already available. 30% could be a good number. You just need enough exposure. You may go from some of these early in vitro things to some of the pharmacokinetic evaluation. 
perhaps in rodents, you know, what is your clearance? Can you minimize this? Does the, the clearance you see in, in an animal disconnect with any microsomal stability you might see? Are there other clearance mechanisms that may come along? You know, what are the issues if your compound isn't already bioavailable? Which of the Holy Trinity here is causing you problems? You may get some upfront toxicity and um, DDI kind of indicators. Have you got any herd? Can you reduce it in your series? Do you have P450 issues? Could you be an AIMS or a mutagenic compound? You, know, you have structural alerts that could be causing issues in your compound. And there's plenty of data in the supplementary to help you on your way there. And are there consensus panels of enzymes or receptors just to get an idea of your selectivity and any potential tox in your compound? And I've included this extra bit in the slide. This is just like a, a, a proposed tiered analysis from the, 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 this group at NIH suggesting a step stepwise analysis of, of your compounds to understand how best to profile them.